For the last couple of years here in Chimin, I've been studying as part of a research team, material relations. And one of our theses was that we need to rethink love as a mode of relation between humans and non-humans. Right? And part of this process was coming to our own philosophy of love. And really, one of my roles in, in, in this process was thinking, well, you know, about the long history of love. And it made me realise, looking at love across a long expanse of time, just how narrow uh, contemporary views of love are. I feel that there's a tendency to see love today as a contract between individuals, that it is something pretty uh, secure, that you, you're finding a completion of yourself in someone else, that you are enhancing one another when you're in love, and that love should basically be something which is pleasure, it causes pleasure, it fulfills you in a pleasurable way. I feel that this is narrow. For, for reasons that uh, I think we can explain by looking at the long history of, of, of love, going back particularly to the Middle Ages and to ancient Rome. Uh, and really I've been exploring how, how love can be painful uh, and how painful love and destructive love, love that actually destroys the self, can be the most productive kind of love and, and perhaps the, the kind of love that we want to emphasise more as a mode of relation in the modern world. It sounds strange. Um, but I think it's borne out through history. Uh, we know about the relationship between love and pain. I mean, it's in our language. You feel love sickness, you feel like an agony of love, uh, you, you know, you're heartbroken, things like that. Uh, modern science has increasingly suggested that this relationship between love and pain is actually uh, is there in the brain. In the brain, apparently, the, uh, the, the same part of the brain is, is, is involved in processes of love and pain. Uh, clinical psychologists talk about uh, people coming to them with deep anxieties about love and that this is a, a condition which uh, causes great pain in individuals. Um, there's a process called cardiomyopathy, stress cardiomyopathy, which uh, apparently is a, is a kind of illness that people suffer when they are deeply in love uh, with, with physical manifestations that are extremely painful. So scientists have drawn attention to this connection. If we look back through Western history, it's interesting how this connection between love and pain has played out differently in different contexts. I mean, the classic example is Cupid and his arrow. Obviously, in ancient Roman mythology, Cupid fires arrows at people, and it's this wound that Cupid causes that generates the love, or is a mark of the love, or stimulates, triggers love. Love is experienced as a wound. Uh, in the case, in Ovid, in his Metamorphosis, writes about Venus falling in love with Adonis. And Venus is accidentally scratched with a wound from Cupid, and it's this wound that she says that eats her alive. She falls so far in love with Adonis that it's destructive to her. She tears off her clothes, she goes into the forest, and she lives with Adonis, uh, and she becomes a hunter. She strips away, in other words, her former godlike humanity, and she becomes lower, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a process of removing her person, of, of, of stripping away uh, her being, if you like, and becoming something more primal. And it's, of course, extremely painful. She describes how she's eaten up. Um, now, in Western discourse, since the Enlightenment, around about that time, there's this idea that there are two types of love, and that only one of them is painful. There's erotic love, carnal love, lust, which is somehow lower, uh, and there's a higher love, a transcendental love a true love. And now for thinkers like, I mean, Goethe, to take one, the German writer, um, it's only the, the carnal love that can be really painful. And Goethe says that the true skill in love is to discern between that which is the lower love, which you should spurn, and the higher love, which you should truly follow. Um, okay, and he says that the lower love can, can drip its poison, with it eat you alive, you know, if you, if you fall prey to a carnal, destructive love. Instead, you want to follow this transcendent love, which generates the, uh, the true human being and the fulfilled human being. Um, the Middle Ages is an interesting case study uh, where you know, we, this, this, this boundary between higher and lower love is completely blurred. Uh, and in fact, it's the Middle Ages, the Western Middle Ages, and I'm particularly thinking about the years 1100 and 1200 where uh, this concept of love is born, that love is something that uh, certainly ad addresses a lack within the self. Uh, and it's in the Middle Ages that we have an idea that painful love is the most valuable, the most productive kind of love, a love that destroys you. Uh, and also that, that self-annihilation itself, um, 
which is which involve which love is involved in the self annihilation of love is that which can take you to God, can fulfil you to the highest levels, precisely through the destruction of the self. So an example of self annihilation in love, someone like Bernard of Clairvaux, who's a Cistercian monk from the twelfth century, enormously important in the philosophy of love, so influential. He's a monk who lives this lonesome. Well, he lives in a community of monks, right? Total chastity. Um, very simplistic living, uh, meditation on scripture. Um, but Bernard writes all of these sermons on love, uh, and he writes an awful lot of, of, of work that will then be translated later into love poetry um, and circulated as a kind of method of how to love, uh, which becomes really popular, moves from the monastery out into the world. Now for Bernard of Clairvaux, it's important, this erotic lower kind of love is not superseded. We don't throw that away and look for the transcendent love. For Bernard instead, precisely this erotic, painful kind of uh, carnal love needs to be appropriated and turned into a transcendent love. What do I mean? For Bernard, there's this fascinating moment in Bernard's early life. He's not sure what he's going to do with his life. He doesn't want to be a knight or an aristocratic um, figure of power. Bernard wants to do something more productive with his life. He's not sure. He might be spiritual, he might not. He sees, a, he says, a beautiful woman across a lake, and he feels this carnal urge inside him, this stirring of feelings of, of love or lust or whatever. Bernard's response is to throw himself into the lake. You know, cold water, cold shower, <laughs> rid him of these feelings. Uh, and it's, it's, he then decides that he, this is such a powerful force that, that it's... Um, it's, it's terrifying to him, right? He becomes a monk. And when he's a monk, it's this powerful force of eros erotic feeling and love and lust that he turns into this very powerful philosophy of loving God. In his De Diligendo Deo, On Loving God, Bernard writes about how all love ultimately flows into love for God. All love, as if love itself were like a spark. Uh, love itself is a force which needs to be not, you know, needs to be channeled and redirected to the right place, which is love of God. So even the erotic love, carnal love, lust, these kinds of lower desire, uh, they're still somehow godly and they need to be turned back to their proper place. So for Bernard, it's an extremely erotic view of a love for God. Um, you know, he, he writes very sensuously about his love. It's almost... Um, well, in places, it's, it's, it's ecstatic, almost orgasmic. I hate that word, but, you know, it, it's an ecstatic kind of love, right? And it's very physical. So for Bernard of Clairvaux, love is ultimately about self-annihilation. Uh, the more you love God, the less you love yourself. You turn away from your own desires. You meld with God's desires. Love of, all love flows to God, and that includes love for self, as well as all these others. So, so love is self-annihilating for Bernard. And ultimately you end up reduced. Your soul is reduced. You flow into the Godhead. And love takes you there. Love takes you to the emptying of yourself and the realisation of yourself in God. Another important medieval tradition is the idea of love as excruciatingly painful, as being something productive. Um, an example of this is Haderic of Brabant. Uh, who's a, she's a, a mystic poet from the Low Countries in the early 13th century. And she writes also about her love for God, but she experiences it as something excruciating. She says she feels consumed by love. She says it is so painful to her, it feels like all her limbs have been broken off, that it is eating her up inside, right? This is her experience of love. And yet she describes it as the force which, uh, which brings her that ecstatic joy. It's the force that is driving her life as mystic poet, as devoted Christian. Um, the culmination of this idea is, uh, is in mystics such as uh, Meister Eckhart and Marguerite Perrette in the early 14th century. And uh, for someone like Marguerite Perrette, she writes about herself being so in love with God that she's completely lost her identity. She becomes simply a simple soul. She's no longer Marguerite, she is the soul. Okay, and um, she writes again about being consumed by love uh, in this way. And it's a painful experience because, I think I mentioned, she feels herself identical to fire. She feels so in pain in her love for God that she feels like she's being burnt up. 
The irony for Marguerite, or maybe not the irony at all, the completion of this, is that she was actually burnt at the stake by the French royal authorities for heresy. This kind of love for God was so scandalous because it, uh, it seemed to cut out all other relations in the world. It was so personal, so direct. You didn't need a church, you didn't need royal supervision, ecclesiastical supervision, intellectual supervision. It was just you and God, and this is an extremely dangerous way of seeing uh, your connection with, with Christianity. I think we can see this kind of painful, self-annihilating self love throughout Western discourse. It's not just the Middle Ages. I think Keats wrote in one of his poems about the painful love that can let true pleasure in, that only through pain can you reach that kind of pleasure. Um, what I think you don't see so much in Western discourse, at least today, is a sense that you need to destroy yourself in order to find true love. Alain Badieu writes about it, the French philosopher, in a very, I think in a way that bridges these views, that, that love is destructive and involves self-annihilation, but it's not completely consuming. He writes about the event of love, where you truly come to recognise the, the view of another, right? That you, the, the view of the one you fall in love with, you, you, you work towards that and you suspend your own. And that falling in love is a, a crisis of, of self-destruction in that sense, that you realise that you're not the limit of your universe, that you need to incorporate another. And it, but for Badju, it's not really about destruction, it's almost about seeing together, binding together, if you like. Why is all of this important today? Why might it have a relevancy in how we think about love today? I would argue that there's a growing tendency to see love as something that we should encounter as a pleasurable experience, as I've said. I think people tend to see love as almost a contract between individuals. Like I make an agreement with you, we're in love and we, we, make this, we make this contract together. I think the danger of that is it doesn't recognise the radical possibility of love, that love can show you something beyond the self, that love can take you to a radical alterity, a radical empathy and a radical humility all right, that can allow you to get beyond a solipsism. I feel that a conception of love as pleasure and contract allows us to stay intact solipsistically. I understand the world around me. I, I don't need another within to change my views. I don't need to accommodate another. I need to simply work with another. Whereas I believe that the self-annihilating view has the benefit of showing us the humility that comes through loving another. I love you and that love is predicated on the fact that it may fail, that I might be stupid, that I need to learn something from you, that living together with you means sacrificing something of myself to build something or to move towards somewhere else. And I think that this on the one hand, I think we'll be happier in love, if, if, if this is really about people being happier in love today, we'll be happier in love once we recognise that it inevitably comes with a loss of self, a sacrifice of some part of the self, and an accommodation, a genuine accommodation of someone else's point of view and feelings and beings in the world. But I also think that that can be a model for more ethical ways of being with other people in the world, um, simply by recognising that we are incomplete, but that we, we also need to, re to lose part of ourselves to accommodate others, right? That we need to sacrifice, genuinely sacrifice parts of ourselves to accommodate the wills of others. That it's not just about compromising, I want what I want, you want what you want, and we'll come to an agreement. It might help us recognise that sometimes we truly need to sacrifice our own desires and even our own sense of self in order to accommodate something else, accommodate something positive that others have to give us.